In today's video we're looking at sizes and types of firms. So first for a bit of background, well what is a firm? It's an organisation that brings together the factors of production in order to produce an output. What a sole property, property, I don't know how to say that word, sole proprietors. It's when there's one owner and it's often a small shop, so for example it could be a corner shop. And then you've got these private sector firms. These are firms that run on a commercial basis. And then there's partly state-owned firms, which often focus on providing services rather than earning profits. So, for example, that would be firms like the NHS. Now, the scale of the firm depends on the nature of the market, the technology within the market, and the structure of the costs. So that's just a bit of background. It's not essential to know for... Um, sizes and types of firms but it is handy to know so how come some firms tend to remain small and how come other firms decide to grow well some firms decide to remain small because the owner doesn't want the pressure and effort of having to expand so it's just easier to keep on a smaller scale it also avoids the costs of having to organize a management team when the owner may like to remain in control and make their own decisions so, for example, if you had, um, if you had, say, a toy business and you liked having your toys this very specific way, you liked to keep it this way and then it got bigger and bigger and suddenly you were having to get in managers, they wanted to change the way that you're, of your toy production things, you thought, no, actually, you know what, I'm just going to stay small and run things the way I like to run things. So just to remain in control is another point. Also, um, formal markets tend to have to pay higher wages so for example um Sainsbury's pay £8.50 an hour comparing to a local corner shop which might only pay their uh, pay their staff £5 an hour so it might be cheaper for them to stay smaller in regards to wages um they might also want to become a local monopolist as opposed to a global one so this could be because they can then provide a more personal service and their opening hours might suit a small town such as those of a corner shop um, however, some firms decide to grow. Well, why is this? Because there's an opportunity for higher profits. The owner might want to enjoy a more luxurious lifestyle and therefore the profits are a nice incentive for a reason to grow. It also allows a firm to take advantage of economies of scale. Now, if you don't know what economies of scale are, I look at this in um, further videos. And it just basically means that the cost of production is cheaper. However, a good evaluation point for um, growing and economies of scale is that they need you need to make sure that the, that the firm doesn't grow too large, that they experience diseconomies of scale. And again, that comes into another one of my videos. Um, they might want to grow to the, in order to gain more market control because this then means that they've got price setting power and they can then discourage new entrants of new competitors. So if you've got more market control than there's less competition which means that you can say actually you know what then I'm going to charge like five pounds for this I don't know this chicken say it's a chicken firm um, they can charge five pounds for the chicken as opposed to four pounds because the consumers don't have anywhere else to go because they've got this market power and therefore they've got this price setting power and also Firms might like to grow because then they can diversify their product, which lowers the business risk as they've got more markets to fall back on in times of economic uncertainty. Now, another thing that we look at um, with firms and types of firms is this principal agent problem. It's also called the eight principal agency problem. It doesn't really matter. But what is it? Well, it's a problem arising from conflict between the objectives of of the principals and those of the agents who take the decisions on their behalf. So what we mean when we say principals is um is the shareholders of the company, the people putting the money into the company, and then the agents are the managers within the co company. So it happens in what's known as a public limited company where the shareholders delegate the day-to-day -day decisions concerning the operation of the firm to managers who act on their behalf. So the shareholders are the principals and the managers are the agents who run things. Now, the existence of the principal agent problem demonstrates, demonstrates that in a large firm, profit maximisation may not occur because the owners of the company are not the ones who are running the company. So the reason why we have this is because 
manages like a nice quiet life and they're not as interested in profits as the shareholders because obviously managers although often they do work on a bonus in order to try and reduce the principal agent problem they do have a set salary which then means that they're not interested they're not as interested in making as much money as the shareholders will be so they're not as concerned um with maximizing the products so that's why profit maximization may not always occur in large firms so managers like quiet life and they're not as interested in profits as shareholders so they do just enough to keep the shareholders happy and this type of page is known as satisficing which i will go into more depth in a later video and why does the principal agent problem occur well it arises primarily from an information asymmetry and that's a year one term where the agents the agents have better information about the effects of their decisions than the owners which are the principals who are not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. So in order to overcome this, the owners need to overcome the information problem by improving their, monitor, their monitoring of the manager's actions. So the shareholders should become more informed about what the manager is doing, or they need to provide the managers with an incentive to take decisions that would, that would align them with the owner's objectives. So like offering bonuses related to profit, then the manager is going to be more likely to try and maximise profits. And a good, um, a good, uh, what do you call it? A good example of this, sorry, is John Lewis. John Lewis make all their workers shareholders, which means that all their workers have got a tiny bit of share in the John Lewis Waitrose, um, company. So they are going to be interested in providing good customer service, which then is going to try and raise the profits of the company because they're going to increase their consumer base and therefore products. So you also need to be able to make a distinction between public and private sector organisations. Well, just simply, public sector organisation is when the industry is contro controlled by the government. So that's going to be industries like the NHS. They're sometimes nat natural monopolies in form. So natural monopolies is um, later it talked about in more de depth in another video. But it basically just means that when only one firm will provide say water for example because it's inefficient to have more than one set of water pipes running across um, a city and they're often associated with pos uh, positive externality so for example less pollution from public transport and they've got different objectives to private sect sector so for example they try to aim to maximize social welfare rather than profits or they might look at having fair di distribution of um of satisfaction things for society and then private sector organization well this is when a firm is guided by a free market and private individuals so free market economists will argue that the private sector gives firms incentives to operate efficiently which therefore increases economic welfare and it's because the private sector is only going to produce goods and services that consumers want therefore it, therefore it's allocatively efficient and the competition between the firms means at lower prices, which is therefore better for consumers. And sorry, I haven't got that last point there. But um, in private sector organisations, so different to public sector organisation where you might have natural monopolies, in private sector organisations, there's often lots of competition which is going to drive down prices because they're forced to become more efficient, which therefore lowers costs for consumers and thus becomes more efficient for society as a whole and you also just lastly sorry need to look at profit versus non-profit organizations so basically you should kind of know this already but a profit organization is when you're trying to aim to maximize profits and this is just to financially benefit its shareholders and owners whereas a non-profit organization is going to have different aims they, they want to aim to maximize social welfare and any profit that they do get is often used for the goal of the organization and the running of the firm. So, for example, any um, profits that cancer research makes goes into researching cancer because that is the goal of the organisation. So that's all you need to know on the sizes and types of firms. I hope you learned a bit more and thank you for watching.